I smoked for a long, long time. And um, when that song came on, it kind of, uh, the Holy Ghost just came over me and uh, it touched me. And, um, you know, God can work through songs and people. And um, on the way to the part store uh, after church, a song came on. And uh, by the time I got to the part store, I had quite a bit left. So I, I, got, out of this, I got out of the truck and uh, I took everything that I had on me. And I went straight to the trash can, and that was um, almost, a, uh, let's see, June 22nd was when that happened. So, and, and I, ha- I had no desire. God took it away, and I said, God, you know, uh, you give me strength. And I, I've been around it. You know, I, I work in construction, so a lot of people, you know, they do that kind of stuff in construction, and um, it doesn't bother me. I thank God for that deliverance, and he can deliver you from whatever you're looking for. You know, if you're looking for deliverance, he can bring you from it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For everything, isn't that right? Amen. Hopefully I can preach a little better than I play the drums. Amen. Just try to fill in a little bit here and there. So glad this morning to see you in the house of the Lord on this Christmas Eve in the we don't get to do it this way every year. It just depends on how it falls, I guess, within a year. But I'm so glad this morning to be able to be here with you. Uh, excited to see so many of the familiar faces and just to, to be in church with you this morning. I'm going to preach something the Lord's laid on my heart, as I always try to do. And this is, I, I mentioned the other night, I said, you know, I don't normally, uh, I'm not much of a seasonal preacher. In other words, if it's Easter, you know, I may preach about the resurrection or whatever, but I try to follow the leading of the Lord, and sometimes the Lord will specifically give me a message that deals with whatever it is going on in the season. I'm just the type of person I'm more inclined to preach whatever God lays on my heart, not just because it's Christmas we're going to preach, you know, Christmas message. Well, today the Lord gave me a message that I believe is... is uh, Pretty well in tune with not just the holiday, but I believe that God is going to talk to somebody this morning. But if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew this morning, chapter number 1. We're going to read uh, verse 18 through verse number 25. Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 18 through 25. Merry Christmas, everybody. Amen. I have a pastor friend of mine, Brother Dan Kellum. Uh, He's a good man. He's been pastoring where he's at for a really long time. I believe it's in Bushnell. And he pastors the York Street Church of God. He posted on his Facebook the other day something that kind of got me chuckled. He said, you know, whenever you run into these people that look at you and say, happy holidays, he, he said, you look at them and say, what holiday is it? And they say, Christmas. Say, thank you. Merry Christmas to you, too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I guess it's a way of doing everything. Amen. Always amazes me that all these retail industries and everybody want to capitalize on our holiday, but they don't want to reverence the holiday. You ever think about that? Amen. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. How many can say this morning, Lord, talk to me? Now, I'm, you know, if you're one of those people that say, I love to learn something about the Bible, about the history of the church and things of that nature, we're going to go to school for just a few minutes here, but if you'll bear with me, I plan to preach with the Lord's help. I uh, took off for a few services there for a while, and I've been back in the saddle, as uh, Brother Clifford would say. And uh, he's, he, I asked him, how you doing? I remember and he'd say, well, I ain't quite in the saddle, but I sure got my foot in the stirrup. Praise the Lord. But uh, I feel like God's put me back in the saddle here, and we're ready to just do the will of the Lord in this service this morning. If you haven't, say amen. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost." And she shall bring forth a son. How many knows who that son was? She shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people 
from their sins. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with the child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew not her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. This is what the Lord has impressed on my heart to preach to us this morning on from the mystery came a Messiah. From the mystery came a Messiah. I feel goosebumps. Praise the Lord. Amen. Raise your hand with me and ask the Lord to have his way in this service. Father, this morning we're thankful for the word of God. We're thankful for the spirit of the Lord that is in this house. And while we reverence the birth of our Savior this morning, we pray, God, that you will grace this sanctuary with your power and with your presence. Lord, there are those among us that want to feel the presence of God. They want to feel the conviction and the challenging of the Lord. There are those that may watch online this morning. We just pray, God, you'll minister to every heart, every life, and those that are listening this morning by your power and not our own. I just pray they'll see you and not me. We'll give you the glory for what you do, and everyone can say amen. And once you're being seated, I want you to look at two or three different people. Say, from the mystery came a Messiah. Most of you that have been around the church or you know much about the history of the church in itself, some of you know uh, that there are many of the Jewish sect of people that to this day they're still looking for the Messiah. Many of them that did not accept, many of the forefathers of that Jewish generation that did not accept when Jesus came as the Messiah, they didn't agree or did not accept that he was, in fact, the Messiah. A lot of this is very important information. If you stand flat-footed and say, I believe in Jesus, this is important for you, for the credibility of your stand in the Lord to know some of these things. But if you were to take a glance this morning at the heart of a Jewish person, the mind of a Jewish person, which did not or has not accepted that Jesus Christ was the anticipated Messiah, you're going to find the following reasons as to why they did not and many still do not accept him as the Messiah. This is a list compiled, a short list of the reason why some of them don't accept him as being the soon coming king, if you will. They did not believe that he would be or need to be crucified. In their mind, they did not believe that when the Messiah came, that crucifixion would have anything to do with their coming Messiah. They also did not believe that he would be the Son of God. They never anticipated that. They never saw that coming. They looked at it like the Messiah that's coming. He's not going to be the Son of God. As a matter of fact, very interesting to know this, they did not believe that he would be raised from the dead and that resurrection would be irrelevant. None of these things mattered to them. Why? I'll get into this in a minute, but one of the reasons why they didn't believe he would be the Son of God and that he would be God was simply because they were looking for a natural mortal man like Elijah, Moses. They were looking for somebody that would come on the scene and that they would set Israel aright, that he would come on like a king. He would be a type of Artaxas or he would be a type of of King David or Solomon or, or, or Saul, should I say. He would be a type of king that would rule or a president like President Trump or like one of the princes in a palace somewhere, but he would be a ruler that would come on the scene and that he would be their Messiah in that form. They never felt like or believed that he was going to be a God in the flesh, so to speak, that he would come down in that nature, that form. They did not believe that as most Christians that there would be a second coming. They didn't believe there would be a need for a second coming. In their mind, what they believed was is that this man, a type of Moses or a type of Elijah would come on the scene. He would be born of a natural birth. He would live his life and he would rule and he would set up Israel 
and all the nations would give respect to them. He would give them a break from and, and abolish basically any war or any savagery against the Israelite people. He would put a complete end to that all in one shot. And when he died of a natural death of natural causes, possibly of old age, that he would have at least one son that would raise up in his steed. But still it yet, just a natural man like an unto Elijah, Moses, not a God, not God himself, but a natural man. That's what they were expecting and believing. They reject the idea that he will be a savior in the sense that he would redeem humanity from their sins. You see, the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah, but they weren't looking for somebody to redeem them from their sin. They weren't looking for somebody that would forgive them of their trespasses and such as that. They had their focus on the first five books of the Bible that were called the Torah. And their mindset was is that when he comes, he'll be so rooted in the Torah that he's just going to reestablish what we already know. And so what did, what did they believe and, and they still expect was this. So we know what they didn't believe in a, in a nutshell, but what they did believe and still expect is that he would be born of mortal man like of Moses or Elijah, born of normal parents of natural conception. He'll be a righteous man, highly rooted and learned in the Torah. He will come through the royal bloodline of David and that he will not be born of lowly means. He will be royal. He will be established. He will have roots, if you will. And as he grows up as a man, that people will take notice of him. He will have high notoriety, highly reverenced by so many different people in this world and in this land. That's what they expected and that is what they still, those that have rejected him as Messiah, still expect and believe today. But you see, the many expectations and realities and even false representations that we see as we look over the last few thousands of years in the contrast of the reminder of life that we now live, how that things don't always work out the way that we may anticipate. I mean, I don't. it doesn't take a rocket scientist for me to understand when I look back at the Old Testament, I see, I see the foreshadow of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, all through the Old Testament. We find places in the Word of God, like in the very beginning where the Bible said, let us make a man in our own image. Who was he talking about? There was a Son, the Son of God. And not only that, when we look at the Hebrew boys, we remember that they say the form of the fourth was likened unto the Son of God. You know, there are different traces and foreshadows we see. We look back to the Bible, and now some of the Jews may have thought to themselves, we're not looking for the redemption from sin. We're not looking for a forgiveness of sin. We've got animals and goats or whatever else that we have need of to abolish our sinfulness and forgiveness of sin. But you remember the Bible said where there is no shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. You see, the fact was uh, that they had it in their mind. Does everyone see that this morning? They got it in their mind that God is going to send us a Messiah and he's going to come in a certain kind of way and if he doesn't come in that kind of way then obviously he is not, cannot possibly be the Messiah. Some of you wonder why I'm preaching like this but you're going to know here in just a minute. You see, the thing is uh, that whenever things don't work out the way that we anticipate a lot of times for me as a human being I see it like this. It's because uh, that I am not in control but God is in control. The Bible said in one place the wind blows where it listeth. In other words, God does what he wants to do. We're, we have not got a monopoly on God. There's not a church of God, assembly of God, a faith assembly, independent, full gospel that's got a monopoly on the will and the word and the spirit of God. God does what he wants to say, man, and he does it his way. And it, uh, come on now, there are some of you, you know enough about the Bible. I wish I had more time that I could go in to explain to you everything that corresponds with the Old Testament and the beginning of the Word of God with the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. I don't have the time that I wish that I did, but I can tell you this one thing, that they anticipated it was going to be like thus and so. No need for resurrection. No need for the Son of God. No need for there to be a Son of God. We don't need that, but I want to read you 
with the Lord's help here, something that I came across uh, that blew my mind, so to speak. If one common held Jewish view uh, is that we await the redemption more than we wait, await the Messiah. In other words, we're looking for liberation and fulfillment of expectation more than we're waiting on a Messiah. In other, come on now. For those of you that are a child of God who call themselves a Christian, I'm looking for him more than I'm even looking for the redemption. In other words, I know that I'm thankful for redemption in their mind. Uh, redemption didn't have anything to do with forgiveness of sin and eternal life in heaven. For them, redemption just simply meant uh, that God was going to set Israel right uh, and uh, give them freedom and liberation from their enemies uh, and let them reign as an individual people. But for the child of God who calls himself a Christian, here's what we believe, and some of you already know this, uh, that we're looking for the Messiah. I'm not just looking for my redemption, but I'm looking for the soon coming king who's going to liberate me from myself. And I tell you, the greatest message and love story that it was ever written was that someone would die in my place. Do you know this morning that I was a Gentile by nature, not a Jew. Hey, Amen. I don't have a Jewish heritage. I needed forgiveness and I needed mercy from my old self. Hey, Amen. But what Jesus does, he comes on the scene and he shows the Jews and he shows the Gentiles. I'm here for all of you. And what I want to do is I want to transition you and I want to transform you and from the God that you used to be and the woman that you used to be into something and somebody else. From the mystery came a Messiah. To the Jew it may seem like a mystery. Why did he come the way that he did? How and why and such as that. We don't believe there's going to be a virgin birth. As a matter of fact there's no need for a virgin birth. But for the child of God you know it had to be a virgin birth because when Adam sinned that was in the bloodline. But when Whenever the Christ child was born of a virgin birth, he was not tainted with the same bloodline as Adam. He took on the same flesh as Adam, but he had the spirit of God in him that gave him the right and the ability to die on the cross and shed that blood for you and me. And because of that shed blood there, his remission from sin, I can say, God, I thank you because you made me a brand new man. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are new. Uh, for the Jew, they may be looking, Brother David, uh, for another Messiah who's just going to say, Israel, put, we're going to put you on the map. Uh, I'm not looking for a king that's going to reign for a little while. I'm looking for a Messiah who's going to reign for all of eternity. Somebody say, man, to them it may be a mystery, but from the mystery came a Messiah. Can somebody say, thank God? Amen. They believe that he's going to be the one. The Jews would believe he would be the one to become a ruler over Israel. He's going to have at least one son. He's going to reign on the earth and he's going to bring an end to war and suffering. Going to free the Jews and such as that. Finally, he will be recognized by the expectations alone and will not be recognized through signs, miracles, or other means. Uh, here's what I thought about on the way to church this morning. And I want you to wrap yourself around this for a minute. I've had different Jews tell me the same thing. And even some in the Jewish commentary I read, they went as far as to say, we believe he was a good man, but we don't believe he was the Messiah. I got a question for you. If he was a good man, why did you crucify him? Think on that a minute. Well, I believe he was a good man. Let me tell you, he was more than just a good man. Come on, somebody. Hey, Amen. We're looking for a king that's going to be born in a palace somewhere. Well, my Lord was born in a manger in a lowly way. And they were looking for a bold man. They were looking for a man with great authority that would speak in such a way. Hey, Amen. He spoke with authority, but he was he came with peace. Come on now. Hey, Amen. He was a humble God. A humble Messiah, but they were looking for a bold Messiah that would come and tell everybody what to do and how to do it. 
Amen. But the Messiah that came, uh, he was humble. He was born in a lowly way. Can I tell somebody this morning, uh, amen, that's the way he intended to be because he had a plan much bigger than all the Jewish nation could understand. He said, I'm coming and I'm going to bring peace right now. I'm going to give you redemption from your sins. Uh, I'm going to let you accept me as a son of God and I will come again. He said in one place, he said, if I'm, in other words, uh, if you see me now, amen, you can rest assured, I will come again. Do you know when he comes back the second time, he's coming to take that bride home with him. Amen, there may be some Jews still waiting on him, uh, but I plan when he comes back to get the bride, uh, I plan to be in that number. Somebody say amen. Somebody say thank God this morning. You see, it's easy for us to understand, those of us that know a little bit about Christian or uh, the Christ theology, if you will, amen, to understand why there were so many things that threw these Jews off like a, a curveball, if you will. They're looking for a mere mortal man of natural birth while yet you and I celebrate a virgin birth of someone that was not just a man but the son of God. Pastor, where are you going? I got a direction, and I hope, I hope, I hope somebody's going to get a hold of this this morning. Somebody say, help him, Lord. You see a mystery this morning. It is that which is hard, that which is difficult or even impossible to comprehend or fully explain. There's a lot of things I cannot explain. How is it possible for a man to be born of a virgin conceptive birth, born of the Holy Ghost. How is that even humanly possible? Science would tell us, well, that's not quite possible. But the word of God, if you have faith in the Lord God Almighty, there was a reason why they had to be born just like that. Say amen, somebody. We don't understand it. So the mystery is why. You know, when I look at it, if he was really the Messiah, and we played it from the other, as they say, devil's advocate, why was he born of an unnatural birth? Why was he born of lowly means and not royalty? Why was he abhorred and not celebrated by the religious? crowd. The religious crowd hated him. They put him to death. Wasn't he? Wasn't the Messiah supposed to be revered by the religious crowd? Did he not become, why didn't he become a great earthly ruler? Was he crucified before the Israelites were liberated from the enemies? Why? Why was he crucified before he ever had a chance to liberate Israel? I'll tell you it's coming. Just hang on to the seat of your britches. Uh, say amen. Uh, why did he only die? Why did he die only to be resurrected again. You see, that resurrection for you and me, it's I ain't got time to preach Genesis to Revelation. I got a lot to preach here this morning. Some of you think about praise God, we're going to be here at one o'clock. Amen. But I can tell you this, he had to be, he had to die and be resurrected because resurrection has everything to do with the old man going down and the new man coming up. That minute that you said, Pastor, baptize me in water. Some of you may not understand, but when you go down, it's just like an, it's a symbol of you going down into that water the same way that Christ died and went down into the grave and whenever you come back up out of that water it is symbolic to when you rise again. Can I tell somebody this morning, uh, amen, from that, come on now, I feel the Holy Ghost, uh, amen, right out of the midst of what you go through, that mystery comes a Messiah and there's some of you this morning, uh, you may not understand it all, I don't understand everything either, but one thing I know, I know what I feel inside of my soul. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. But the religious crowd abhorred him. Why? Why did our redemption have to be paid for through crucifixion? And why does he have to come a second time? Could he not finish what he had to do the first round? But out of the mystery, somebody say he came. <laughs> A Messiah. I'm going to tell you this morning. Some of you may think to yourself, I'm beginning to feel the power of the Lord all over my soul. Mm -hmm. Why is, you know them songs where they're, mm -hmm. I'm going to start doing that right in the middle of preaching this morning. 
Why is it that it is so relevant to you and to me today? Because I believe this. There are people just like I was, the place that I once was, that whether it was from your past, whether it was from other people's thinking, your own thinking, you are held back by reasoning and cannot see beyond the scope of what you or others have framed your life to be. I have preached this over and over, and I'm just going to give you a short little brief little stint of my testimony. When you have a room full of counselors and therapists look across the table and tell you by the time you're 18, you'll be in prison. Your pastor was supposed to be in prison. There's other thing. Huh? What about that choir leader who once had a black book with a lot of men's names in it? She was known around town and had a reputation, but now she leads God's choir in praise. Come on now, somebody. What are you saying, Brother Marsh? From the mystery came a Messiah. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I don't understand it, you see. There are some people, they may think to their self, Pastor, you ain't got no idea. I've spent the last few years of my life trying to be a certain kind of somebody, trying to put an image in front of everybody like I'm so bad, I'm so tough, I'm this or I'm that. Can I tell you this morning, I don't care if everybody else has lost confidence, you'll ever amount to anything. Your son or your daughter might be backslid this morning, uh, but can I tell you from the mystery comes a Messiah. I can't always explain it. Uh, amen, as I looked over my past, uh, my wife said it this morning uh, I would have never thought I'd be a preacher's wife uh, I'd have never thought I'd be a preacher of the gospel I never would have thought I'd pastor a church uh, but I can tell you here I am uh, and I'm killing it with God's help say amen somebody you know how it's done uh, it's because whenever everybody else can't understand it uh, you may be sitting there this morning and say it don't make a lick of sense to me uh, I got children uh, and there's some mysterious things uh, that are going on uh, why did God give me that child for him to live backslid. Uh, God didn't give me that child to live like that. Uh, don't you lose confidence? Uh, don't you lose hope? Uh, because when it looks like it should have been another way, God said just give me a little time uh, because out of that mystery, I'll bring a Messiah in the midst of everything you've been through. God said I can turn a mess into a masterpiece. Amen. Somebody raise your hand right now and say thank you Jesus. I can tell you there are some of you that are here this morning that can't quite understand. In the mystery of barroom nights, Jack Daniels, a reputation that you wouldn't want to tell to the average Christian person what you've done, where you've been, the things you've said, the way you've talked, the way you've acted. And the regrets, deep regrets of things I wish I could change. But in the mystery, out of the mystery, why? was my house right across the street? Why was I around the campfire right across the street from a church? Come on. Some would have looked at Pastor Meyer's life and that have said, ain't no way. There ain't no way. My granddaddy, as much as I loved him, my granddaddy, when I got saved, for the first year, two, three years, he said, that boy's a good actor. He's God. He ain't no preacher. He's a good actor. Huh? That's what he said. He hurt my feelings. You ever have somebody you love hurt your feelings? He hurt my feelings. And I told my wife, I said, well, I don't care what he thinks. I know what I got, and I know where I got it. You see, just like the Jews, there ain't no way. How's that possible? I mean, God put a calling on my life, but I've, I've done failed too many ways and too many times for it to come to pass. There's some of us. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. There's somebody here this morning, God's trying to talk to you because out of the midst of the mystery, you say, Pastor, are you telling me that even though things have been a mess, that somehow another God can make something out of it? I'm telling you just that. You mean to tell me that my children and all the mess they've been, they've been in and out of jail more times, Pastor, than you can imagine. 
Ain't no way they could ever do anything and amount to anything. I'm not losing hope. How about you? Because God has a way of using the foolish things to confound the wise. I've said this before. I'm going to close here in a minute because I feel like somebody God's dealing with them and I don't want to overpreach this. Some of you think a pastor preach on, but I just feel the Spirit of God. You know, I've often said to myself, you know, there are times that people think there's no way that God can do anything with me. You have no idea the things that I do and how I've done them. I'm going to tell you what you've allowed people to do is put you in a box. You've allowed your past to put you in a box. If it don't happen this way, then it ain't going to happen. The last few years of my life, Pastor, don't make sense. They don't have to. Why did I go through what I did go through? It didn't seem fair. Why have I been a reckless renegade? Why have I been such a rebel? Is this the way I'm going to die? Huh? Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost. By me sitting here telling you, it is an understatement. Paul said, I was chief among sinners. You looking at him. Here I am. I wouldn't want anybody to put on that wall up there everything I've done in my past. How about you? I'd be embarrassed of a lot of stuff. Well, you were raised. No, no, I wasn't. I didn't know much about this. I had a grandmother that told me my grandmother was a church, in the church of God and my grandmother was Pentecostal and my grandmother told me about the Lord and she had a sense of faith about the things of God and such as that. That's about all I had. My grandmother, Melva Grace, would put me up on her knee and tell me about the Lord. I remember one time that my grandmother, I told her I was having these bad dreams. She said, honey, she said, when you're having them bad dreams, she said, you just rebuke it in the name of Jesus and you plead the blood. Man, I pled the blood and didn't even know what in the world I was doing or saying. But Grandma said it was right. And guess what I found out? Grandma was right. You see, I spent a lot of my years being reckless. Uh, and there's some of you here this morning that can testify and say, Pastor Myers is right, y'all. I spent a lot of years wasting a lot of years. Uh, and you're thinking to yourself, Pastor, you just don't know what I've done. And you just don't know where I've been. We got any ex-drug addicts? Raise your hand and hold it up for a minute. We got any ex-alcoholics? Put it, put your hand up, raise your hand and hold it there. Huh? We got any ex-adulteresses? Raise your hand. Oh, some of you probably, oh, Lord, have mercy. You got to be kidding me. Raise your hand. You got any ex-fornicators? Raise your hand. Huh? You got any ex-thieves? Raise your hand. Huh? I used to be. But because there was a Messiah that came out of the midst of that mystery of my life, I ain't him no more. You see the beauty of the masterpiece that God wants to make you, Uncle David, is that God wants to take a life you remember the story in Jeremiah chapter number 18. One of my all-time favorite stories. If I die, y'all mention this at my funeral, okay? Jeremiah said, I, Behold, I went down to the potter's house. And there I saw there was a potter there. And he wrought a work on the wheels. And he said, Behold, the clay that was on the wheel was marred. In the hand of the potter. And the Bible said it seemed good to the potter to make it again. I love you Jews. All due respect to you. But there are too many things that line up with the coming Messiah and what I read in the Old Testament. Because he said, I'm not going to take in, I, I, I'm not, I just want to make you a little bit better than what you were. Come on now. I want to make you another person. I want to turn you into brand new because on that lump of clay I was marred. I was a thief. I was a liar. I was a pervert. Come on somebody. 
I was a jerk. I was a cheat, an adulterer. Pastor shouldn't say all that. I said I was. But when the Lord came and found me, I can celebrate Christmas in a whole different way. Because I know what he did whenever he found that lump of clay on the potter's wheel. My, my, my Lord. I feel like there's somebody in this house right now because I can feel this in my spirit like grandma's butter bowl and her turning that spoon around in there. Hmm, I feel this in my soul. You, you keep thinking to yourself, there's no way, there's no way. I could never, I could never do it. I'd never be able to do it. Hmm. I thought the same thing. The only difference between me or any other blood-bought child of God who's serving the Lord and serving Him right is one thing. It starts with C and it ends with E. A choice. One decision. I'm going to tell you this morning, you're going to find that God uses many different circumstances in your life to bring you to crossroads. Anybody that's now saved, that you can look back over your past life and see the different places where God tried to get your attention. And you thought about it for a while, and then you went right back to the way you were. The only difference is a choice. And if I could add anything to that, is to follow that choice with determination. You see, for me, when I made that decision, I had to, lose, I had to leave a lot of that man pride. I'm going to preach to you men for a little while. I had to get rid of my man pride, Sister Farmer. Men have this certain air, got to be tough, I got to be bad, I can't cry, and all that kind of stuff. I'm the baddest, whatever. But I had to let that go because in my eyes, I've told you this before, my marriage was on the verge of a divorce. And I, my wife and I, you know, we've been together since she was 13 and I was uh, 15. I was about to lose the best thing that God ever did in my life, and I was about to do it on my own, on my own accord. And my life was a train wreck. It was a mess. And I finally got to the place that I looked at my life. And I said, which do I want? I want to go this way or do I want to go this way? Let me tell you, God was setting the stage for this preacher. You know how? I was told this possibly before, but I remember a man, John, John Isaacs, I think was his name. Remember Isaacs? Well, the Isaac family, they used to go to Ferndale years ago. And I don't know all of them real well, but the one Isaacs, he had a car lot in Leesburg, Florida, right down where the HYC used to have their youth camp, right down that area. And I went to this car lot. I, I was maybe 16, 17. I don't remember exactly, but my wife and I had been dating for a while. I, I wasn't faithful to her. She wasn't faithful to me like we should have been. There was a lot of foolishness that I, I and her both wish we could go back and change and our relationship and I don't hold that against me I'm now saved I'm not that man anymore but I sat down in the office of John Isaacs and I remember brother Steve Griffith I sat there and I looked across the table at his wife as she began to do the paperwork and uh, she said uh, so y'all are married I said no ma'am I said we're just dating and she said oh well that's real sweet I said now we've been together for a long time she said oh that's just like me and my husband and I said well my biggest fear is is that we won't make it is anybody as a married couple you ever worried or wondered that that we might not make it? Come on, we may never even get married. But I, I told him, I said, my biggest, I told her, I said, my biggest concern is, uh, I said that we may not make it. And and she and I said, have you got any advice? I said, you've been married all these years. Uh, here they are, they're an older couple, they got their own business and such. Uh, and she looked at me and she said, I can tell you one thing. Uh, she said, give your life to the Lord uh, 
serve him with everything you got. And she said, God will work out the rest if you put your faith in him. You see, God was setting a stage, Brother Dean, for me way back there. And I didn't realize what God was trying to show me. You see, when my marriage was on, uh, whenever my marriage was on the rocks uh, and we were in a place I was about to lose everything I had, uh, I could still hear in the back of my mind, uh, never discount what somebody tells you. Never discount what you tell somebody else uh, because I find sometimes people hang uh, on the fewest little words that you say. But I still remember in the back of my mind, Brother Billy, amen, Sister Isaacs, uh, as she looked across the table and said, serve the Lord with all of your heart. Uh, and on all, in the month of August uh, in 1997, uh, I stood about three pews back on that side of the church. Uh, and when the opportunity came, uh, I thought to myself, uh, I've done tried everything else. Uh, let me try this. Uh, amen, I believe he can do it. Uh, I gave my life to the Lord. Uh, it hadn't been easy all the way. But God turned me around. Not presence, not gifts, not family reunions and get togethers, but really, that right there is what is at the heart of Christmas. Sister Meyer said this morning, usually when it's your birthday, you get gifts given to you, and yet Christ on his is given to us. The greatest gift of all time. Paid for with his own blood. You see, I've had people that would tell me, Pastor, just getting married and serving God in and of itself, it doesn't guarantee that my marriage won't fall apart. And I agree with you to a certain extent. I'm going to tell you the difference. Here's the difference. When both people on both ends of that rope have put their confidence and faith in God, I now have a dual responsibility. I'm not just responsible to my wife. Because in times of frustration and aggravation and when the marriage goes long, I may get aggravated with her and say, hmm. Oh, you nothing. She may feel the same way towards me. But in the most difficult times of our marriage, and if you get married or you're already married or you're thinking about marriage, let me tell you, it will get tough. Will you ever think about divorce? It will cross your mind. Like it or lump it, it will. But in the most difficult seasons and places of my life, even in the times when I slammed the door, Brother Billy, stomped out of the house, Jumped in the car, peeled out, and headed down the road. You've done that? Come on now, folks. You see, I believe in being transparent. I ain't talking about building something up that's not achievable. I'm telling you, sitting, I remember one day, and I, oh, when I do this, people really listen close. I found that. Whenever I tell some dirt up on me, y'all is listening so close. You stop playing with the babies and you stop going to the bathroom and everything else. One night sitting in Claremont, Sister Benefield, I pulled up in a park just down the road from where we lived. Boy, I pulled up in that parking space, Sister Tracy, and I was mad, mad, mad. <clears throat> Sick of this. It's ridiculous. And if you know me, that's my favorite word. Ridiculous. Huh? I sat there and I thought and I thought and I thought. Boy, it's about to get real. But you see, I don't just have a responsibility to this precious woman right here. But I also have a responsibility to him to be faithful, and that wouldn't please him. And I don't just want to please her, but I also want to please him. My wife herself, they all really listening. When she went through a time of depression, times I would walk in and find her curled up in a ball because our family went through some of the most ridiculous stuff, and I mean stuff that would make anybody just want to just lay down and quit. 
One night she told me, she said, if I didn't know I'd go to hell, I'd probably end my own life. Well, it's getting real, ain't it? You got a certain sense of obligation to not just you, not just your spouse, but also to the Lord. My Lord, y'all looking at me hard this morning. Pastor Myers preaching reality, whether you agree with it, whether you like it or not. Well, I was looking for somebody to get up in a fancy suit and tie and bless me, make me feel good, tickle me under the chin, and send me on my way. Hey, man, I'm preaching to you everyday reality the way life really is, uh, and it ain't always easy. Hey, man, there may be door days uh, when you slam the screen door and say, I ain't looking back, and two hours later you're back laying in the bed talking to each other about how what you're going to do tomorrow. Come on now. Hey, man, come on now, somebody. Hey, man, I don't always understand it but in the mystery of everything that's been going on in your life the Holy Ghost sent me here to tell you that out of that mystery can come a Messiah out of the midst of everything you've been through there is still hope you say there's no hope for my marriage it's been a mess for the last 20 years and ain't nothing gonna change now let me tell you if you get a husband to get saved sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost you'll be dancing with a new partner tomorrow come on somebody you get a wife who gets saved sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost you ain't got to worry where she's going when she gets off work. You ain't got to worry who she's on the phone with or what she's talking about. Can I tell you when I used to be lost? You're looking at somebody, man, I was so jealous. Where you at? Where you been? Who is he? I ain't never heard him. Who's that talking in the background? What's going on? Hey, man, what's this weird number here? Hey, man, well, who was here? I see tire tracks in the ground. Who was here today? I mean, I was so jealous about everything. Let me tell you some little secret. Some of you men, some of you ladies, uh, some of the most jealous people are some of the most guilty. And I'm charge you nothing for that. Always worry, because you know you're getting away with it, so you think she might be too, or he might be too. Come on now. Hey, Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to dig myself a big old hole. Y'all might have to find me somewhere else a pastor next year. Hey, Amen. What I'm saying to you is this. Hey, Amen. What you need to do is you need to sell out to God. That is the answer. Hey man, well, what I need is I need a better job. Boy, if I make about $25, everything will be better. Let me tell you, there are plenty of people out there making $25 years, dollars an hour who are still in bankruptcy. There are people out there making $50 an hour who are still in bankruptcy. And you think, well, more money is going to fix all my problems. Uh, I ain't going to tell you that money don't make things feel a little bit better. But money ain't going to make it make everything better. There's people out there that are lonely as I don't know what uh, and still killing it, making plenty of money every day. But they're lonely and they got no peace in their heart mind. Uh, but you see, I can live in a cardboard box. There's homeless people standing on street corners with a sign uh, who ain't got nowhere to live, uh, nowhere to lay their head, that have got more peace than some people driving Mercedes Benz and Jaguars. Uh, why is that? Uh, because the greatest peace in this life, uh, it came from a, comes from a baby that was born in a manger, amen, died on a cross, amen, because out of the mystery comes a Messiah. Amen. Woo! I can't understand what's been going on in my life. Can't understand why it's been going the way it is. I don't have all the answers. Join the club. I know one. And I'm going to go with what I know. Been in it too long to switch sides. He's kept me. When I thought I'd lose my mind. He's kept me when I sat in a motel room and wrote a last letter. Saved it on a file on a computer so somebody could find it. Oh, come on now, Pastor. Look at me crazy. I'm going to tell you something, folks. It is my allegiance to God Almighty that's kept my feet planted right here for nearly 10 years. It's God Almighty that has allowed me to celebrate almost 25 years of marriage here. It's God Almighty that has kept me through the storms that everybody else thought that I'd go under. Come on now. You may tell you something this morning. You may, you may have other people that look at you. Oh, he'll never make it. Prove them wrong. When my grandpa died, the same one that said I was a pretty good actor when I first got in this, 
told me all the time, boy, I'm proud of you. And it wasn't because any great thing of, of me. It was because of what the Lord did in my life. He made the difference. He's the one that changed me. Huh? Huh? Is there anybody besides me this morning that can say, I'm glad I made the choice? My life is like the Lego blocks that the little children put together, red and green and yellow and blue and purple or whatever, and every little building block until I'm... 50-something years old or 40-something years old or, Pastor, I just turned 30 and I've got a lot of past behind me, a little bitty tiny things that have happened, building blocks of my whole life. I can tell you this. You'll look just like the same Billy. Your wife will be glad of that. But the radical change God does in your life will make you a husband fit to be with. I feel the Spirit of the Lord in this house. Brother and Sister Farmer got a beautiful story of what God did in them. She is a preacher's daughter. I'll never forget him telling me she looked just like Ellie Mae from the Clampets. Boy, when he told me that, I thought I'd laugh my shoes off. Ellie Mae from the Clampets. Some of you young people looking at us like we're crazy. You don't even know what I'm talking about. But out of that mystery, God took a Marine, wasn't saved, made him a preacher's daughter's husband for all these years. Now, how in the world did that come about? There's probably plenty of things that he could sit here and tell us with his head hung down. But you guess, guess what? He ain't going to hang your head down no more. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house this morning. The Spirit of the Lord sent me here with a message. You wanted Christmas? This is as Christmassy as it gets for Brother Myers. And I'm just going to tell you, you've been looking for something. I've got to tell you one more thing here before we close. At least I'm going to try. There was a sister that we knew years ago that we loved dearly. And her name was Sister Lee. She was raised in a past, uh, in a godly home. Her daddy wasn't serving the Lord. He was backslid for many, 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 many years while her mama prayed for her. And she had fell away from God, got out of the loop of doing what she should have been, went off to college, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and got around a crowd, started doing drugs, and started doing all kind of things she shouldn't have been doing. And Per her own testimony, she said that there were times that some of the other people would be like, no, 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 you don't do that. And you, you, you know, you, in other words, people look at you like, oh, you're not supposed to do that. We know what kind of person you are, what kind of home you were raised in. And she said it would aggravate her. And she just, just in spite of that, she said one night, she said that they were at a party and uh, somebody had offered her some marijuana and she smoked that. And a little while later, I don't remember if it was cocaine or, or something like heroin, whatever. And and she said, I want some of that. And they said, oh, no, said, uh, we're not going to let you do that. She said, no, I am going to do that. Well, she kept persisting until she did it. All of them were as high as they could be, jumped in a convertible Mustang, hit the open road. And I don't remember how fast they were going, but they were speeding, and they hit the top of a bridge. Probably in Dukes of Hazard fashion, they topped the top of that bridge, went airborne, and when they landed on the other side, they landed off the median and hit a tree in mid-flight. They were ejected. I believe someone was killed. I don't remember. But she went past the windshield of the convertible. It tore almost all of her calf off. She has had more surgeries than anybody I've ever known as far as plastic surgeries split her head open and all of this kind of stuff. And in her testimony, the first thing she wanted whenever she came to was her praying mama because she knew that her mama could get a hold of God. 
And out of that mystery of why it all went and happened the way it did and her refusal and rejecting God, she stood before a big crowd one day when she gave her testimony, and I was in tears listening to it. I wish you could have heard it as well. But she said, I spent many years of my life, I remember this part specifically, trying to put a round peg in a square hole. I tried relationships. That didn't fix it. I tried better jobs. That didn't fix it. I tried drugs and alcohol and recreational drugs and such. That didn't fix it. But she said the day that I finally let the Lord come into my life, she said, I wasn't putting a square peg in a round hole anymore. She said, he was the only piece that fit. And I'm going to tell somebody this morning on this Christmas Eve day, you can try everything you want to. Come on now. You can go down to the nightclubs. You can hip. You can hop. Watch your shoulder, making sure that your best girlfriend's not flirting with your man. Huh? Hipping and hopping and always looking over your shoulder about who's, who's looking out to beat, you, beat the daylights out of you. I stood outside my home one time when my brother was about 19 years old, I want to say, somewhere around there, and he kept looking over his shoulder, and he was nervous, and I said, man, what's the matter with you? I'd pulled up to my parents' house, hadn't long been saved, if I'm not mistaken, around this time, and I said, what do you, what's the matter with you, man? He's like... Man, he said, uh, me and some of the boys we run with, he said, uh, you know, there's a big fight here a while back, and uh, we beat this, this guy up real bad, and now there's a bunch of guys that they're looking to catch us by ourselves, and all blah, 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 this and that. And all of a sudden, Brother Dean, it dawned on me, and I looked at him. I said, buddy, I said, I'm going to tell you one thing. I done lived that life, and if there's anything I can tell you, I'm glad I don't live like that no more. I'm not telling you there ain't always somebody out there that could or possibly do something crazy. I'm just telling you that I've lived that crazy, wild lifestyle. And I, if I could tell you anything, if I could trade anything at all, I wouldn't trade nothing for what God has done in my life right now. Brother and Sister Benefield are going to come this morning and, and help me close this service out. I, Come and play, Brother Farmer, that's what I meant to say. Sometimes when I get, when I get a headache like I got right now, my mind gets kind of fuzzy. I'm just going to tell you, the enemy may get in your ear and say, it's not possible. God can't do anything with you. He'll ne- you'll never be used like another person. You don't have the background. You don't have the clout. You don't have the position. First of all, don't ever try to be anybody else but who God wants you to be. Second of all, you can't do anything about your past. That's already been written in history. But with the Lord's help, you can rewrite the next chapter of your story. You hear this morning say, Pastor Myers, the last few chapters, matter of fact, the whole book stinks. But God didn't give me this message for no reason. Stand your feet all across this house with me. It's a mystery. Two group homes. Juvenile Detention Center, expelled from high school. Constant fights. In between in a halfway house, halfway between jail and a group home therapy was a 15-year-old boy that one day at 44 years old on Christmas Eve would get up and preach how that out of the mystery came the Messiah. Only God can do that. Only God can turn this world around. 
You don't have to look real far, Sister Jennifer, and you see the Hollywood stars. For years, Robin Williams entertained us with his comedy and his humor. But even a man of his stature and a man with so much talent in all of that, I can tell you that the only real peace is in him. As every head is bound and every eye is closed across this church, I promise you I'm not here to embarrass anybody. But I know that there's been a few hearts that the Spirit of the Lord has been tugging at and you felt that drawing, that conviction of the Lord in this place. And I want to invite you to make one of the most bold statements of your life just like I did in 1997. A decision that because of that I got a son married to a Christian girl serving the Lord, preaching daughter talented serving the Lord loving the Lord and another son helping with ministry around the church and such as that I'm a nobody from nowhere the only difference was a choice turned it all around had I not chose the Lord I don't know sister nor where my marriage would be this morning If that's you, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm asking you to make a bold statement and come down to the altar. Make a bold statement and come down to the altar and say, Pastor, I'm tired of I'm tired of sinful living. I'm tired of rough living. I'm tired of waking up guilty. I'm tired of disappointing people. I'm tired of people being disappointed with me because I can't seem to get it together. Children of God, let me encourage you. If you see somebody praying that needs prayer, help those that need prayer this morning. I never know where somebody's at in their life, what they're going through. But this morning, I'm asking you, Lord, to do the impossible, the unthinkable that the world may feel is impossible. Renew and revive in the name of Jesus. Our friends and our families, Lord. Help us. We're living in difficult times. Pastor, I've tried rehab. Pastor, I've tried to do so many different things to kick it. In and out of programs. In and out of jail. I'm telling you right now, You say, well, I'm already serving the Lord. Well, I want to ask you, are you really sold out? Are you just serving the idea of Him? Are you serving Him? 